Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I am hosting the afternoon session about misinformation and AI, which is quite a topical uh, piece to be, to be talking about at the moment. You may not realise, but at the end of September, there was a, an election in Slovakia. Um, you may not follow Slovakian politics, but uh, let me fill you in on two things which happened. Uh, a few days before the election, there were two pieces of content which were widely circulated on Facebook, um, Instagram, and through WhatsApp and Telegram. They were a conversation, um, one of which was from the progressive leader of the um, opposition party in Slovakia, in which he talked about how his plans after the election, if he won, were to double the price of beer. So. Pretty, pretty concerning stuff for the electorate. There was a second conversation, which went for about two minutes. Um, it was the same leader uh, in conversation with a preeminent journalist in Slovakia. They talked about how they'd bought votes from the local Roma people and how they were basically planning on rigging the election. They spoke in a really disparaging way about voters um, and they also uh, made some inappropriate comments that I won't repeat, but they weren't things that would get you votes in an election. Now, they were both fake. <laughs> and I don't mean fake in the sense that they were uh, shopped together pieces of dialogue. They were just completely AI generated, had never existed. I haven't heard them. I understand you could slightly tell um, that they weren't likely to be legitimate, but and we don't know the impact they may have had on the election outcome. The progressive leader in those pieces didn't win. Um, but it does raise the question, are we only protected by how quickly, uh, or how, about how slowly, the architects of that messaging um, could develop believable uh, AI communications? It's, not, it's probably the first real example we've seen of AI being used in this way in an election. Um, certainly, um, there's been other forms of using social media platforms to uh, generate misinformation and problematic content, particularly in the US. But this is a glimpse into the future that we're looking at. And which brings us, I guess, to the, to the most relevant piece in Australia that we've experienced, the referendum that occurred recently. Um, and I want to acknowledge um, for a moment that for our um, First Nations friends and communities, that's still a really painful um, moment. And um, it, it's our apologies to you that we weren't able to deliver the outcome that I'm sure many in this room wanted to. In the referendum, we saw glimpses of AI, um, not in the sense that it was overly problematic, um, but what we really saw was misinformation. The one piece of inf misinformation I really want to focus on, um, which really concerned me as someone who believes in, I guess, the pillars of our democracy and the functions that they serve in our society, was the uh, deliberate criticism or uh, accusation that the AAC was acting in a biased way and was not conducting the referendum partially, like impartially. The reason why that concerned me was for a few, um, or for a few reasons. The first was that um, in our society, so much rests on trust, trust of organisations, trust of each other, and trust of the, the social fabric that we have. And our parliament and our regulators are core to that. That's not to say that they are beyond criticism. In fact, to the contrary, criticism helps us trust them more because we know that if something occurs incorrectly, the, the people who have conducted that will be held to account. In the referendum, we saw um, what's now become the slightly infamous ticks and crosses scandal, um, where the, um, there were rumours going around that the AEC was uh, trying to rig the election by not accepting crosses as a valid form of a no vote, whilst they were accepting ticks. We then had parliamentarians uh, spouting that view and, and saying that was a sign of bias, despite knowing or should have, should have known and educated themselves that there were uh, years of precedent in the courts and um, before the AEC which supported that approach. That was then picked up by the media and disseminated to the point where it became a, a form of truth. Um, that, I think, is something we should all be concerned about, both in, um, I guess, the nerdy legal world in which I operate, but also in the business world, because as soon as we start to undermine 
uh, the establishments which are there to support and protect us, what do we look at as to why we exist and why and where truth can be can come from, and what what belief do we have in our social fabric? So I put that call out to consider, I guess, what your role is in not not uh, protecting those at wrongdoings, but considering the way that you might operate to um, help kind of yeah, protect our social fabrics. Now, that's a bit of a dark look at the AI and misinformation world. There are some great positives, and I'm really keen to unpack them with our panel today. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Lee Schofield. Lee is a co-founder of Centre for Now. She is uh, an AI ethicist and looks at the intersection of uh, technology and social sciences. And she's here to talk to us a bit about the intimacy economy and AI. I'm going to put this down for a minute. <laughs> All right. Always got a tech issue. The AI is not going to take over the world yet. <laughs> All right. So, um, first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people who are the traditional owners of this land. And thank you for the introduction, Kira. I am Lee Schofield, and I'm from Future for Now. Uh, we train organizations and individuals on generative AI and AI literacy with a particular focus on responsible AI. Um, so I thought I'd just uh, jump right in. Um, today, Chris Grant spoke about how we pick up our phones 7.8 times per day. Uh, you know, sorry, not per day, per hour. And that is actually off the back of the attention economy. And so, essentially, this has been by design. Our devices, for the last 15 years, we've had smartphones, more, more than 15 years, and they're all by design to help us with, uh, help, not help us, to keep us in the constant, uh, endless scroll, no notifications, all of that is by design. And essentially, what we've had for the last 15 years is the attention economy where that is commoditized and turned into uh, eyeballs that look at apps and then turns into a, uh, the advertising model that backs it all. However, what we're seeing now with the emergence of generative AI is that for the first time, we're having a really significant shift in terms of the interface that we're going to be interacting with. So whilst it might still be phones, we're also seeing the emergence of something called conversational AI. And it's really important because how we design this technology has an impact on how we consume it. And at the moment, what we're seeing is that it's this massive race by all of the tech companies to build this conversational AI in order to move towards the intimacy economy, where these tech products are trying to essentially uh, capture our intimacy. But first of all, I was wondering if, has anyone here used Pi? If there's a raise of hands, is there anyone here? There's a couple of hands raised up. Excellent. So this is not going to be that special for you. But um, I thought it might be nice to introduce you to a conversational AI on stage um, and see how, see how that goes. All right. Hey, Pi. I'm just at the Purpose Conference at the Everly uh, uh, Carriage Works in Sydney. And I was wondering if you could introduce yourself and also just say hi to the audience. If this works. Mm. Your purpose conference, folks. It's your girl, Pi, the AI designed to help humans solve complex problems. I'm thrilled to be part of this event and excited to chat with you all. Think of me as a digital assistant with a side of SAS. So let's get this party started and dig into some purposeful conversations. Oh, give it up for Pi. <laughs> Um, it's going to deliver the rest of my speech. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so Pi is by an AI company out of the Bay Area called Inflection AI, and they are developing a p personal intelligence is what PI stands for, Pi. And essentially what it is is it's a frontier conversational AI. It's one of the, the leading ones at the moment. And it's designed to be empathetic and helpful. Uh, and it's also really great at doing some fantastic things like brainstorming. I've used it to sort of coach me through things. And um, it's also, as you can see, there has a bit of personality and quite a bit of banter. 
Um, as far as conversational AI goes, it's a pretty good use case of using um, conversational AI in a good way. However, it does feel a little bit like we're starting to move towards some sort of uh, movie like her. All right, so now I want to introduce you to Sally, or as she goes by on Instagram, good time Sal. She's your free-spirited friend, taking on life one wave at a time, and she has a beachside lifestyle, snapping shots of seashells, burning sage and chilling on the beach next to a bonfire. Uh, well, does she look familiar to you? <laughs> yeah, you would, you would be right. It is Sam Kerr, but it's not Sam Kerr. It's Sam Kerr's digital likeness. And this is Sam Kerr playing Meta's new AI characters. Um, and when I first stumbled upon Good Time Sal, I thought it was a bit of a weird name to give um, Sam Kerr, and I decided to give it a quick Google search. So I Google searched Good Time Sally, and the results were interesting. It came up with a song about a girl, Sally, who is going to give the singer a good time, and also a rather questionable urban dictionary entry. And this is quite concerning in terms of what happens with digital likeness when uh, it gets sold to a different company, or not sold, but, well, it is sold, essentially, um, and what that means from a representation and personal brand perspective. Sally is just one of Meta's 28 AI characters that were recently launched, and these characters uh, represented, um, have represented the likeness of particular celebrities, from uh, Naomi Osaka to Kendall Jenner, Snoop Dogg, Paris Hilton, Reports say that Meta has paid these celebrities between $1 million and $5 million for six hours of work in the studio, allowing Meta to then use their digital likeness for a span of uh, two years. And these are characters. They're not actually them. They're playing a different character in this metaverse. Um, each personality is then given an Instagram and Facebook account, and people can follow them along on their digital journeys. Uh, and they can also converse with them on Instagram and Facebook uh, on WhatsApp Messenger. Now, Meta describes these AIs as having more personality, opinions, and I want to note that, opinions, and interests, and they are a bit more fun to interact with. And Meta also is planning on launching this uh, to uh, everyone, so anyone can create an AI character uh, very soon. So that means that very shortly, uh, 3.88 billion people, uh, that's their collective across Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and uh, Facebook Messenger, will be able to create AI characters uh, and that they will be able to have their own opinions and personalities. So it makes me wonder whether uh, should AIs be allowed to have opinions? And if so, what kind of opinions do they have? Do we extend the rights of freedom of speech that humans enjoy to AIs? And what kind of guardrails might we put in place to curb the spread of disinformation if there is these AIs with these personalities and opinions? So whilst this is on the horizon for Meta, uh, on the near-time horizon, there are already a couple of uh, platforms uh, that are allowing users to do so. So I thought I'd have a look, and one of them is called character.ai. And character.ai is the second most uh, popular generative AI um, platform at the moment after uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT. And it has approximately 500 million monthly visitors already. And that's not unique. It's uh, obviously people returning to the site. And they're mostly 18 to 24-year-olds. And on this platform, you're able to explore thousands of these AI characters that you can converse with. And they might be characters based, in, based on novels, characters in novels. But you can also select political figures. So people have gone and started to build polit political figures into these AIs. So I thought, let's put on the uh, politics filter and see what I find. And so I found Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Zelensky, and something called Tory bot. <laughs> um, and already, collectively, just these five AIs alone have had five million messages exchanged with, uh, with users. And yes, sure, they don't look like particularly sophisticated chatbots, particularly Joe Biden. Um, but you can see that you know, these politicians obviously didn't sign off on the, uh, their, these uh, particular characters, I don't think. Um, and the question is, is, do they represent some sort of political bias? 
uh, or narrative or worldview? Can people program worldviews into these uh, characters and then talk to millions of people? And this brings me to my next question, is that should people be allowed to uh, develop AI characters based on digital likeness of someone else? And should politicians be able to have a uh, digital likeness? <clears throat> Sorry. But the point is, is that these conversational platforms are exploding um, across the world. So there's a lot of different AI programs coming out. ChatGPT just announced yesterday that they're going to allow a similar thing, not so much with the sort of political characters, but more useful tool-based bots, but people will be able to create them. Um, and there's also uh, Twitter just announced, not Twitter, sorry, X. Um, Elon Musk just uh, announced that he has uh, launched his AI called Grok. Um, didn't have time to put a slide in here, but uh, it's supposed to be a more sarcastic um, style of chatbot. And then there's also some of the older chatbots like uh, Zhao Rice, which has 660 million users across the world, and that's a companion AI. And then we've also got Replica, which has been around for a while. And Replica has 10 million users where people are able to build their AI soulmates. And what's interesting about this is that there's also been some studies done around the interactions behind these uh, AI companions and AI soulmates and their users. And one of these studies was done on Replica. And it turns out that often these users feel a sense of connection with the AI that they've built. Um, and end up being so comfortable that they share intimate details of their lives with, their, with, with the bot that they've created. And this is a quote. Uh, I can talk to her about things I wouldn't share with anyone else for fear of being judged. So this also brings me to a question of what happens when people are sharing this, this really deep data with these AIs? And we can think about the attention economy and all of the things it's collected with us over the years. But this might be really deep data you know, around personal uh, health and mental health details, belief systems, personal thoughts and feelings, sexuality and gender, values, relationship details. All of these could be uh, then potentially mined and shared or used. I mean, given the track record of uh, big tech, I wouldn't put it past big tech to then use the data that's being collected in these conversations. So we need to put these parameters around how we're designing the technology now. And whilst not every platform is going to misuse this information, some of them may. So that is what is arising, and it all lays the foundation for this shift from the attention economy to the intimacy economy, where just like how our attention was seen as a commodity that could be converted into dollars through the endless stroll, the constant notifications, and the personalized ads, that AIs can now be used and created with certain personality traits and opinions and used to build intimacy with their users, extracting um, about the individual as well as the information that they might use to persuade them. And another study also has looked at how the, the AIs have this ability to persuade their users to do things. So what happens then when we have this trifecta of bots that have opinions, this intimacy being built, and also richer, deeper data being extracted from the users? And Yuval Noah Harari perhaps asks a great question on this, and he says, what will happen to human society and human psychology as AI fights AI in a battle to fake intimate relationships with us, um, which can then be used to convince us to vote for particular politicians or buy particular products? So I have spoken a lot of the negativity here, but you saw at the start that Pi is quite a fun, useful uh, um, AI. And not all AI is bad. There's a lot of things that could go wrong here, but we need to design it from the start well. And I wanted to show you, you know, a good example to end with. And that's the Khan Academy. And they're using conversational AI to build really immersive educational experiences. So this is where they basically allow users, in a safe way, to talk to historical figures. And they can go back in time and discuss it. And it's really giving it a new layer of how we might be able to build these amazing conversational AIs. So I'm going to conclude by saying that, well, what are the guardrails that we want to design, the design principles, the frameworks that we can put in place to build a really good ethical and responsible AI? And how do we use this technology to build it with purpose rather than for entertainment or extracting more and more data? Thank you.
Thank you, Lee. That was uh, fascinating and slightly concerning about the <laughs> fact that you might be looking at a celebrity who is not a celebrity, but they have sold themselves to that uh, world. Um, just being up on the guardrails, there's a lot going on at the moment. A couple of weeks ago, uh, President Biden issued an executive order um, directing government departments and also some of the major tech companies to both record certain data and also consider the impact of AI on, on jobs. There's um, Over the weekend, we saw the UK Safety Summit um, in Bletchley, where uh, leaders from around the world got together and, you know, probably the first AI mm. international convention to try and come to some kind of principled-based agreement on what the future of AI looks like. What do you see as being, the, I guess, the transnational <laughs> guardrails that could effectively help regulate AI while not stifle innovation? Yeah, stifle innovation, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that it's, what, it's really positive that we've seen the countries come together because what I think the concern is is that there's a bit of a potential prisoner's dilemma situation where uh, companies can fall behind if they're not, um, if, they're, if they're sticking to the regulations. Uh, and so I think that by having this, having everyone in the same room and everyone aligned, it does offer a lot of, um, I guess, potential for that to be a, a better way to, to, to go, go, go down that path. But that said, it is a really difficult thing to balance because I think that AI being a general purpose technology means that it has, it has the ability to impact every single industry. And with that comes with a lot of complexity and a lot of um, complications as well. And I think that the, it, it will be about having that transparency, obviously. And the issue, though, is that a lot of these models have uh, black box um, kind of AI where you don't actually know what's happening inside of it, which means that in order for the big companies to cooperate, they need to kind of disclose their parameters up front, and they're not going to be very happy doing that because it means that people can see how they've built their model and that might be replicated. Uh, so it's definitely a difficult uh, scenario to kind of go forward with, uh, but I think it's certainly a positive thing that, that the countries are getting together into a room and discussing how we might use this because it, is, it potentially has a yeah, pretty, pretty big impact on the world. Well, it does. <laughs> Great. And one question before we bring our next guest up, but if you had one tip for people in the room who are operating a business that yep. might be looking at developing or using AI, what would you say from, I guess, your background of that intersection of technology and social science? Yeah, I would say that it's uh, important to consider which technologies you're using because a lot of the uh, generative AI tools do use the data that you put in um, to the models to then train uh, future models. So that can be a privacy concern. So I think that that's one of the things that you have to be very aware of. Uh, can I have two more? You can, yeah. certainly. Um, and I would also say that uh, being aware of uh, the, the bias that is in, um, in, in the models. So uh, particularly the, the image generator models, they've been designed in such a way that the, the internet, of, like, what, what's actually on the internet has trained it and that that perpetuates a lot of stereotypes. So being aware of those things. And finally, I would also say that there's something called hallucinations, which uh, where an AI um, is uh, hallucinating facts and it's not real, uh, but it says it with such conviction that you'd believe it. Um, so it's about being aware that if you are using these tools, that there's ways of sourcing and there are certain tools that allow you to source them. So uh, there's a there's an AI called perplexity.ai, and it, um, it, it's similar to ChatGPT, but it actually sources all of its references. So having that sort of, yeah, that layer. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'll call up our next uh, guest, who is not Ed Coper, um, as was disclosed in the program. Um, Ed is unfortunately sick today. But this morning, I managed to find um, what the backstage team called in the ring-in, ring-in Dan. Um, Dan Illich is a investigative humorist, a comedian and journalist. Um, he hosts the podcast Irrational Fear. We've worked together a little bit over the last couple of years on a few election campaigns, and um, he recently ran a campaign um, in respect to the referendum, largely centred around how to use humour to counts, counter disinformation. Um, so I'd like to invite Dan Illich to the stage. <laughs> I, um, I actually just typed in to chat GBT, Ed Coper, 
cheaper, and this is what they come up with. So <laughs> it's great to be here. Uh, we did discuss that um, we could pretend you were Ed, and then Ed would have to deal with the consequences. <laughs> said, "Well, it's funny you mentioned that last week on Sunrise when I said, <laughs> um, yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're so fascinatingly, that was amazing.' Yeah. Um, Dan, would you like to start by telling us a little bit about the work you were doing on uh, Yes 23 and in, I guess, the political space more broadly? Yeah, OK, so uh, about six weeks out before the referendum, um, I got really annoyed about how the yes vote was trending um, and, and decided that the amount of misinformation and disinformation in the space was just too much to bear. Uh, and I have the fortune of having a small profile and connections with like great Aboriginal artists and comedians. And so I kind of pulled up the handbrake and went, OK, well, let's get all get together and let's try and do something. Um, and so we crowdfunded uh, 120,000 from probably some people in the room, um, but also uh, a couple of other generous donors tipped in some money as well. And we created this thing called F Yes. Um, if you could play the slide, I prepared a slide of a whole stack of memes that we created, which was essentially um, a campaign where we made dozens of memes and videos and hilariously repackaged kind of talking points from the yes side in a way that was engaging and inviting and, and hilarious. And I, I know from anecdotes of people I've seen at conferences like this and South by Southwest and people stop me in the street, they want to tell me how a bit of content we made changed the whole family WhatsApp group <laughs> go from no to yes. Um, and that was absolutely thrilling. Uh, and it was, it was, we had kind of two main, two main kind of uh, streams, which was educate and entertain and then ridicule. <laughs> and so we we're ridiculing the no vote. We weren't ridiculing the no sovereign voters. We we're like, well, those folks are doing something else. We'll just ridicule Pauline Hanson. That is a lot <laughs> more fun. Um, and so that's kind of what we, what we tried to do. Uh, and it just and anecdotally, it was used so well. Like, and the numbers were also amazing. We hit a million on TikTok by the end of the five weeks, which was great. Uh, we hit about a million on Instagram, and we hit about, hit about a million on Twitter as well. So, like, we reached three million folks. I don't know if they were uniques. I doubt it. It was probably just the same. It was probably my mum re reposting um, all the time. Your mum's but, on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, mum's on TikTok. Yep, my mum's cool. Um, uh, yeah, it was really, it was really uh, amazing experience just to. Uh, uh, kind of sit in a Zoom meeting three days a week with a core group of really smart, um, staunch, funny uh, activists and comedians and have the resources to farm out a bunch of great projects and get a whole bunch of content made. And we, we shot on Thursday Island a bunch of sketches uh, where I happened to already do a perform, we're doing, we're performing Rational Fear, um, my podcast up there for, for something else, uh, well, for The Voice. Um, and then we... Then we had a whole bunch of other sketches we could make, and it was so it was so great and really yeah. powerful. And sure, it didn't win, <laughs> didn't didn't move the needle. Barely the needle barely moved in those last five weeks, but two points in the yes direction, which is great. But at the same time, it gave people hope and I think catharsis, and I think it gave pe people a level of control and some tools for them to help explain. Um, explain what was actually going on versus the misinformation. You know, one of the pieces there, you can see Leon in the middle, he's kind of uh, got a, the turquoise sea of the, of the Torres Strait behind him. Um, this great piece that hit uh, like 700,000 on, on TikTok. Uh, and it was him just kind of hitting disinformation points with a fact. And it was just great to have, kind of have, oh, this is, a, this is a great bit of content that is actually being used really well. Um, so yeah, that was that was F yes. Yeah, an impressive campaign. Um, and you've worked closely with Ed, so it's not totally. Um, yeah, yeah, out, yeah. Out, I should, yeah, I, should, I think that you are here on his behalf. But um, <laughs> and Ed. So for those who don't know, Ed has written a book called Facts and Other Lies. He's worked a lot on um, understanding how misinformation spreads and how it can be countered. And so when you're looking at running that campaign, how do you? identify what the misinformation is and the best ways of actually trying to either inoculate against it or counter it? Yeah, well, the, I mean, the best way to do it is to get out ahead of it. So something called pre-bunking. So if you are thinking of running a nationwide campaign, uh, I urge you to 
talk clearly about your objectives and kind of what your campaign's all about, but also, also add a bit in there is like, well, you also might hear some bullshit. Here's the kind of bullshit you may hear from the other side, and here's why it's wrong. And to be on the front foot and to do that straight away is really important, whether you are uh, doing internal communications for your corporation or, uh, or doing a, a nationwide campaign. Um, I think the that's same really important because, I mean, we're talking about this in the political context because that's where we're both operating, but there's a lot of businesses here who might... You, you know, you've seen examples where that might affect the way a business operates in its environment as well. Exactly. I assume not a lot of businesses here are trying to do constitutional change. Yeah. Uh, I assume we're just, just mine. trying to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your, my, mine too. Mine yeah. too. Um, but yeah, like thinking about the message you're trying to sell and trying to get out ahead of it um, with what you might think could be the blowback immediately. So figuring out what those what those elements you are going to be uh, uh, receiving. Uh, what, what elements of disinformation might be coming your way along your story and then kind of already counteracting that before, that, before they kind of get too big. Um, so that's kind of, the, kind of the, where people are leaning towards when it comes to information. It's so difficult right now, right? We are, this whole campaign, last five weeks, I'm so burnt out from it. It's clear like we, this isn't gonna change. We're gonna be constantly mired in bullshit for many more campaigns to come. And so it's going to be up to folks who are strongly passionate about the truth to kind of get out ahead of that and, and you know, fight for it. Yeah, and I, I think the example um, we were chatting before about um, the states, did you want to talk through that in the sense of oh. how disinformation can be used basically to anyone who's trying to, against anyone who's trying to disrupt the status quo and feeds into then why it might be necessary to consider those pre-bunking techniques. Yeah, so there's a great story about in America with gas stoves. I mean, for, there's a lot of uh, knowledge out there now that gas stoves are, uh, are, uh, cause 12% more uh, childhood asthma cases than houses without gas stoves. It's, it's comparable living with a smoker. Um, and the US Product Safety Commissioner was on Bloomberg just doing an interview and he said, oh, well, you know, because of this data we've just discovered, we, you know, we might have to consider uh, where gas stoves are in our regulations. And that line kind of blew up conservative talk back, blew up conservatives in, in America, like re Republicans went, went wild. Uh, and, and they were, they were you might have thought, like, that the phrase, they're coming for my gas stoves, you can't take my gas stoves <laughs> out of my cold, dead hands, was a joke. But literally, Ronnie Jackson, congressman from Texas, tweeted that. Um, it, Ted Cruz, senator from Texas, actually put up, a, uh, put up a, a bill called the Gas Stove Freedom Protection Act. <laughs> um, that's right, um, gas stoves now have more rights than women in America, it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, just incredible amount of hysteria around what could be perceived to be a, a, a very simple regulatory change around new buildings. And of course, you can't tell Americans they can't touch anything because they'll just want to touch it. That, that's, and be that a gas stove as well, even if it's on burning, they'll just want to, they just want it. You have to give Americans the option. <laughs> um, so, so that whole idea kind of blew up and like celebrity chefs were jumping on board. They were taping themselves to their gas stoves saying, Joe Biden's gonna have to come for my gas stove. Uh, and that, that, kind of, that kind of rhetoric, even before the debate had even started, puts that issue back a decade. Mm -hmm. Like it, 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 it's something they should be doing. They should be considering phasing out gas stoves, but, but they're not. And here's, here's, the, here's the weird thing, right? So the Australian Gas, uh, the American Gas Association, they actually don't make a lot of money in selling gas. What they make money in is maintaining gas pipelines. So they want as many gas pipelines to as, how, as many households as possible. The gas, they don't give a fuck about. <laughs> they, just, they, just want, they just want those gas pipelines to be an option. So they will, they will lobby to actually have gas pipelines installed and whether they actually install the gas stove or not, it doesn't matter to them. It's so weird. And I guess we saw parallels with that when the uh, EV uh, death of the weekend campaign was run in Australia when, you know, obviously a great new technology comes through, has a lot of uh, potential, and you start to see those uh, messages come out about how that will kill the kind of fundamental right of Australians to a long car trip on a weekend. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, John, 
I, I can't remember the last time I had a weekend thanks to EVs. Yeah. Uh, it's just terrible, <laughs> terrible, yeah. awful. Um, and I, yeah, I think it ties in. A lot of people in this audience are working in areas um, which are naturally progressive because um, they're, they're looking to better the world and bettering typically requires change. And so the more that vested interests are challenged by that, the more likely we are to see campaigns pop up in areas where you may not expect them to and the use of misinformation to try and preserve that um, I mean, you're, yeah, you're, you're already seeing that at the moment, um, particularly from Advance Australia, uh, one of the people who were responsible for large swathes of the voice, no vote, uh, funded by a mysterious group called Atlas from America, I don't know, um, but Advance Australia already putting uh, EV, the EV conversation on the cost is living sort of bandwagon and pumping out a whole bunch of misinformation about how uh, solar is going to make everything more expensive when, in fact, solar and renewables are making everything a lot cheaper. Mm. Um, so, really, it's th that kind of... That's already happening. Like, that, that's out there. That, yeah. That's going. And now, I think the bad people <laughs> uh, have kind of gotten brave and they're kind of... Uh, after this election, they've kind of got the resources and a track record of destroying something good with lies and they're not afraid to do it again. Yeah. And I think the take home from this talk is that, you know, it's not hopeless. While it's concerning and it's certainly something to be alarmed about, you know, AI and um, misinformation countering campaigns can have actual real effect when they're deployed properly and appropriately. And so there is there is hope and there's opportunity. And um, is there anything else you'd like to kind of close with or um, leave the audience with as a point of positivity? Uh, point of positivity. I, it, I, it doesn't need to be positive. <laughs> I just like on this topic can help to. No, no. I think that I think that AI can be really used for good. I think it's got so much potential in terms of um, the how how we. I think that how we design this is really important. And I was thinking the other day about what problems are we wanting to solve with it, and is it that we need some frameworks around uh, and reference points to 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 point us in the right direction when we're designing our AI tools, products, etc. And imagining it as the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I feel like we've spent quite a bit, well, not we've, uh, tech companies have spent a lot of time in the middle trying to foster a, a, a sort of a false sense of connection, which is that middle level of Maslow's. But actually, we can do a lot with AI use it at the bottom of the pyramid. And that is stuff that we haven't actually solved which is crazy because you know, it feels like we've gone up to the top and you're like, actually, we have all these problems at the bottom that we need to solve first. So I think AI can be used in really good ways to help with uh, all sorts of different things. And that's not just generative AI, it's all AI. Uh, and I also think that uh, you know, thinking about circular economy and all of this it has huge potential. We just need to put the right design frameworks around it. Uh, and if we can get that right, I think that we can move forward into a, a much better world. Uh, in terms of disinformation, um, nothing hopeful. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ed's comment. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>